Jesus reminds us that in the beginning, God created a man and a woman, and he brought the two together, saying, the two shall be one flesh. And so he established the relationship between the husband and wife as the foundation of all human society. Before governments, before relationships between children and parents, work relationships, team relationships, friendships between men or between women. There was the foundational relationship of a husband and a wife, the two being one. And conceptually, this is a very simple model. But the power of this relationship is such that it has throughout history been attacked. And so Lamech took two wives and since then powerful men have sought to have two or more wives to the ridiculous extreme that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And if you do the calculations, that implies a wedding every two or three weeks for all his reign. But that was in direct disobedience to God's instruction to Moses that a king was not to multiply horses, he was not to multiply silver and gold for himself, and he was not to multiply wives for himself. The variations on relationships between males and females have not been limited to a husband having two wives, but there are all kinds of relationships that are expressed today many of them outside of the commitment of marriage, making the relationship one of convenience. Those problems were in the Roman society of the days of the New Testament. And while the Jewish people generally followed the biblical pattern, Roman society did not. John the Baptist lost his head because he dared to criticise King Herod for taking his brother's wife. Jesus reaffirmed the importance and sanctity of marriage when challenged about divorce. The departure of Roman society from the biblical model is outlined in Romans chapter 1. And so when people become Christians, this is one area in which things need to be made right. Things need to be brought into line with the scriptures. My name's Arthur and I thank you for joining me as we continue looking in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Some had argued that it's good for a man not to touch a woman. They had gone the other extreme. But Paul has said in 1 Corinthians 7, Because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. The Lord created very powerful sexual urges within people, and so it is normal for a man to have his own wife, and a woman to have her own husband. And that within that confine, let a husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. This was all part of God's wonderful plan. Even going so far as saying a wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise the husband does not have authority over his own body, but his wife does. So the union of operation, not just sexual, but in all areas of physical contact, we have a mutuality. He will go on in chapter 11 to talk about headship, the fact that God has appointed the man head over the woman, not to say that the woman is any less, but as a matter of order. Just as in a society, a man might be appointed as head of a company, he may or may not be the best person for the job. But while he has that job, he has that responsibility. And so it's not a matter of whether the husband is better for the job, but it is God's order and pattern. But we'll get there when we get there. So it's normal for marriage, and it's normal to engage in sexual relationships within marriage. This is God's plan. But some men are single. And so he says, I wish that all men were even as I myself. But each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. In other words, there are some men and there are some women who will remain single. For it is not a command that you must marry. You may remain single, but it is usual that people marry. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, 
it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Later writing to Timothy, Paul will advise that young widows should marry again and re-establish a home. And so what he's talking about here is that it's okay to be single. You know, there's good things that can happen if you're single and there's good things that happen if you're married. And they are different. Both are good. And the use of better in this thing is to say, if your desire is to marry, it is better to marry than to burn with passion, to be distracted or to do other things outside of marriage. Now he continues in verse 10. Now to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. But to the rest I, not the Lord, say, if a brother has a wife who does not believe, and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? So there's a strong imperative here against divorce. Whether you marry or not is your choice. But having married, the Lord says, do not divorce. Divorce was not part of the plan. It was a concession, Jesus says, that Moses gave the children of Israel. But it was never their command. Sometimes when a marriage comes to a rocky patch, a husband and wife might separate for a while to regain their feet but the emphasis here is that it's not God's plan to break up the marriage for the wife to depart from her husband but if they need to separate he said let the wife remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband so while ever the husband lives the intention is if the wife has left her husband that she live in hope of a restoration A husband is not to divorce his wife. This is the purpose and plan of God. God uses the marriage, as we see in Ephesians, as a model of the relationship between Christ and his church. And Christ will not give up on his church, even though the church has become very corrupt and distracted. And many in the church fail to honour Christ by doing what he says. Nevertheless, Christ does not give up on the church. And so the husband is not to divorce his wife. But when you become a believer, that is definitely not a reason to divorce your unbelieving spouse. Rather, the promise in these verses is that God will bless your marriage, your spouse and your children, even if your spouse is not a believer. And the possibility is and has often happened that both people end up becoming believers. And God blesses the marriage in that way. The husband will pray for the wife who is an unbeliever. The wife will pray for her husband who is an unbeliever. But if the unbeliever chooses to depart, then in the interests of peace, the believer allows that to happen. If the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. That's not saying that the believer pushes the unbeliever out. The believer will do all he or she can to maintain the marriage because marriage is important to God. But God has called us to peace. And if the unbeliever refuses to accept the believing spouse and wants to leave, then let it be, Paul says. But the object is always that people might be saved. How do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife?